Hi y'all, I'm Hannah. Hi, I'm Pam. Hi, I'm Ann. Hi, I'm Marie, and we are coming to you live from Austin, Texas, because it's Happy Wally Wednesday! Hey everyone, happy Wednesday, happy last day of February. Is it Dr. Seuss's birthday today? Is it? I So my phone said it was Dr. Seuss's birthday, so I didn't post anything, I usually do. So if it is, we say happy birthday to the doctor. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, Fire Mountain Designer Packs right now. Oh, <laughs> and I'm going with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> got, a, got a good bunch of stuff today running around. Busy bees, busy bees, and we are ready for a great show with you guys here today, so thanks for joining us. We're going to get started. Hey everyone, I'm Marie, and if you are joining us for the first time, we are Living Felt. We are based here in Austin, Texas. This is what we like to do on Wednesdays. And are we in the group? We are. We okay, are so I missed our start here. Uh, Anne, would you hit start? We're trying to double record so we get a better recording for YouTube. We got our red light. If you are joining us for the first time, we are coming to you live on Wednesdays. This is what we do on Wednesdays. And let me help Anne here just one second. Are we good? Okay, we're good. So we're recording. Check in, say hi, and tell us where you're from. I'm going to refresh my screen here so that I can see you. Um, let me just go out of our group and back in. You'll see that people are checking in, saying hi, and where they're from, and I want to say hi to a few people also. So I'm going to look for you. There's Rachel in Oregon, and Amber Lee in the UK, and Pam is in Canada. Hi, y'all. Thanks for being here with us. I see everyone is just now chiming in, so we're going to just get this ball rolling and we're going to do some really fun stuff today. So I did post an update of what we're going to talk about, and for those of you who are new, this is what we do. Our community has submitted topics and suggestions and questions, things they want us to address. Today's broadcast would be kind of a smorgasbord and we'll do our best to address as many questions as we can. Um, and we may not get to your questions. So what we plan to talk about today, we're gonna answer some of the quick wet felting questions that came up. We're gonna talk about facial expressions on your felted characters. And we're gonna look at felting with armature. We're gonna do some um, dry needle felting and we're gonna try and do some wet needle felting also. So that's our plan. A lot of you are asking about dye techniques, and so the dyeing we plan to do next week. We plan just to have a show dedicated to that. Good? Good. Okay, and so, do y'all like my dragon? We get some love. So this dragon was custom made for me by Terry Horning, and um, Terry's in PA, and I saw that she was needle felting these dragons with these um, locks. So these are her locks and she dyed them. They seem to be all like felted down the center. So it's like a dragon boa. And his head is Living Felt MC1. I'll take him off so you can see him. Uh, it's Living Felt MC1 red indigo and the purple, blue, the blue part is actually indigo. So he's amazing. And I just want to say thank you so much, Terry. I love him. And he's very warm on this warm, on this almost spring day. We're having the girls just said it's going to get up to like 85. Is that right? Like 85. Okay. So uh, we are going to do a couple of product highlights. A few of you who have asked to see a few things. So the fairies are going to help out and I'm going to let them take over. Thanks for being here, y'all. Hi, everybody. How are y'all doing? So I'm going to show y'all our um, a few of our spring colors in our Merino Top 19.5 Micron. So starting up here, it's going to be yellow. <laughs> Me knocking things over. <laughs> We've got the yellow is going to be Sun, Tide Pool, Xenia, Begonia, Kiwi, as well as purple. So those are the ones that we picked out for our, our fun little spring colors for today. Thank y'all. All right, y'all. I'm gonna show you the Angelina, our new colors of Angelina. It's going to be um, the uh, lemon sparkle and the plum. 
yeah, turn that a little bit into light, like just, and you can. Can you see that sparkle? Mm -hmm. Very pretty. And I just want to let y'all know that we have a total of 16 colors of Angelina here. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. And uh, this, we carry them in bags of a uh, quarter ounce. And so it kind of looks like this. This is the amount you get. So check them out online. Bye y'all. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're hoping you're, that you're as excited for today as we are. It's really our favorite day of the week. I have got something very, very special to show today, and that is our newest specialty designer bundle right here. Perfect for all of your spring needs. <laughs> it's going to be called Early Spring. It'll be on the website later this afternoon. And um, we'll just run through the, the colors real quick in the merino top. Starting right here, we have got powder blue. This is citrus, larkspur, chartreuse, and ballerina. This is the Mint Sparkle Angelina. The Sun Tussa Silk. This is Sunset Merino Silk Blend. This is Honeydew Merino Silk Blend. Oasis Bamboo Top, Lavender Silk Hankies, and the Kiwi Sorry Silk Waist. Oh, and I almost forgot about this guy. Tulip Neps. <laughs> yeah. Sherry Tamburo says, love your hair. Aw, thank you. <laughs> and Kate uh, Housley Williams says, oh my, that calls to me. Sharon uh, Denier says, it looks like candy. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Kate asked, are there any pink Angelina shades? There are some pink Angelina shades. We will try to pull some of those today and, and show ya. Yeah. I think oh, we've got one, one, one to two, the magenta too, one, maybe. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, I mm -hmm. can qualify. Mm -hmm. All righty. <laughs> fun. Great, Anne. Can you wet felt with the Tessa Silk? Okay. Aren't those beautiful? So last week, y'all asked if we had a pack, and we said no, and we thought, well, what we can do is a big bundle. So if you look under the specialty designer packs on our website, look under the wool section, look for specialty designer packs, and this will be there just like some of the other big bundles that y'all have come to know. So super, super fun. And Penny asked, can you wet felt with the Tessa Silk? And the answer is absolutely, Penny. So earlier I posted a link to our BFF felt along that we did last year. Definitely check that out because we incorporate all of the embellishment fibers uh, with the exception of the Tessa, um, the sorry silk waste, we didn't have that yet. So watch that video and see how we incorporate all those fibers into our felting. And then while we are just cap off that Angelina, um, Anne brought in what we have, we don't have pinky pinks, we have watermelon and we call this fuchsia, watermelon and fuchsia. So those are the closest things we have to a pink, but this, you know, n not next to a purple can certainly look very pinky, super fun. Cool. Thank you, Anne. It'll go great with this with this pack right here. Oh, my gosh. Gosh. that is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what, y'all? I want to do one more show and tell. Some of you are posting that it's warm, and some of you are posting there's still snow in the yard. My dad's in Denver. There's a little bit of snow still on the back porch. And while we're just at the end of the season, I want to show you this little treasure that I acquired from someone in our community. And um, some of y'all have seen it online and I wanted you to see it in person. This dreamy little snow village was made by Kimberly Czar and her Etsy is Czar Designs. Where do I go? Down a little bit. Czar Designs. And she's used the CX2 white in this beautiful snow cone swirl. Um, our spruce for the dark green. This is mahogany. Um, this over here is bamboo. This is like marina, I want to say. 
And I think she, oh, this looks like white. Someone else said they stippled snow on with like paint, but, and she says she gets her teacups and stuff at the thrift store. And I just found this so divine with the acorn caps, you know, sprinkled with glitter glue or whatever it is. And I wanted to share it with you all and say thank you, Kimberly, for making this beautiful creation and inspiring us so much. Wasn't that fun? Okay. Oh, so Paula asked what kind of fiber is Angelina, and Angelina is actually a polyester. So it doesn't felt. You have to anchor it down with fiber like any other non-felting fiber, um, but you can iron it, and it binds only to itself. And pretty soon, we're going to do some fun stuff with Angelina film. Uh, that's going to be online pretty quick, so we're going to show you some fun things you can do with that as well. But the Angelina fibers are just bling if you make art bats or anything like that, work them in. You can needle felt them in and wet felt them in. You just have to incorporate wool with them to do that. Are we good? We're good. Okay, cool. Thanks for being here, everyone. Okay, so I think the first thing I'd like to do is answer just a couple of the wet felting questions if I can find my um, way to them. Marie Marie uh, says, what kind of resist template do you use if you want to felt a purse with a flap? And actually, someone posted some coin purses online in a group this week, and Hannah just did some coin purses over the weekend, too. So those are super cute. So if you're going to do a purse with a flap, I'm just, I have this uh, resist available. This is our um, resist material. We're still looking for a super duper name. You can see how thick it is. It's really sturdy and durable. And if you're going to make a purse with a flap, you would use a resist that could be a rectangle or it could be round or oval or whatever. The only thing you're gonna do is stop the fiber on one side and run it up the other. So in this case, let's say that this is the front of the purse and the flap is gonna fold down. On the one side, you run the fiber up to this level and on the back side, you run the fiber all the way up. And it can be shaped however you want. And I want to sort of speak to that a little bit. Like let's say you want it to be wavy or whatever. What you'll notice when you are wet felting over resist here and just loose here, that you're going to need to add a little more wool on the flap to give it bulk. And sometimes it can help, you know, if you're folding the fiber back in to give it bulk. But also, as you wet felt the piece, the flap itself tends to get a little more narrow where it joins the purse. So if you're making your first one, uh, you might want to let it be a little more organic and free flowing. And that's why you, I think also that so many people do asymmetrical flaps when they're starting because it's so hard to control that fiber right at the joint. Often it doesn't come straight, straight, straight down. So just think about that. But your resist is pretty much gonna look like this. Run the wool up to here on this side and on the back, however you want the flap to be. I hope that helps. That was for Marie Marie. I'm going to check you off Marie Marie on that one. Um, Leslie, oh I didn't bring a sample. So Leslie asked how thick to make, how thick to make a vessel and is MC1 good for that? So Leslie, regarding wet felting a vessel, girl make your first one, get her done. Yes, you can use our MC1. It's a great fiber to use. And watch our wet felting over resist video, which is free. It's on our website under learn, or it's on YouTube in our channel under wet felting videos. It's super easy. You'll make a little tiny vessel. And what you'll find is the thickness that you like to work with. A single layer of our MC1 is going to be too thin. So go ahead and add multiple layers and um, play with that. Make your first one and see how it goes. That's all you got to do. Get your fingers wet. Get your fingers wet. Okay, I don't want to be a talking head. So the last thing I'm going to answer here um, dry is from Diana Densmore asked, how do you know if something has been over felted and how do you trim the stray fuzzies? So for the record, and I know we've answered this like three times and maybe Diana, sweetheart, you have been absent, but the thing with over felting, it depends on what it is. So our answer to that is you can over felt something if you want it to have drape, uh, you want it to be flexible like with wrist warmers or something, it's possible to overfelt those such that they become too stiff, too thick, 
to actually be wearable. But otherwise, if you're making a vessel, if you're making a wall hanging, if you're making um, a fabric that you then want to cut and sew and be rigid, you know, felt it all the way and see, make your sample, felt it all the way as far as you can and see does the fiber have the characteristic that you're wanting. If you have fuzzies, trim them or shave them. You can control fuzzies by the fiber you choose um, and you'll need to make a wet felted sample to see how that goes. Our short fiber merino bats should not be fuzzy. Our merino tops should not be fuzzy. Even our MC1, properly wet felted, will not be fuzzy. But if you do have fuzzies, shave it. Get a disposable razor, shave it, trim it with scissors. That's totally acceptable. So, practice, try, reach, explore, expand. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to a couple of more things. We had a great question from Lori Ebert, and she said um, that she, with her dolls, or her, I'm assuming this with her dolls, she wants to know how to get different facial expressions. And so I'm going to share with you a couple of resources and a couple of examples to consider if you're felting with your dolls. Your first resource is this right here, your own beautiful mug. Get in the mirror and do whatever you want your character to do. That can be challenging, but now you can selfie yourself to death and take lots of pictures. Have a partner or a friend or a family member pose for you and take their picture and notice or even pose for you for a second and try and capture that expression. If that seems too challenging, you can get something like a book. Here's a book just dedicated to facial expressions. Does that show? This is called um, Facial Expressions. Yeah, A Visual Reference for Artists by Mark Simon. I'm sure you can probably get this on Amazon for next to nothing. We don't sell these books. But here's what's fun about it. This book is filled with um, double page sets each person does a double page set of expressions and angles of the face so you can see them making different, I mean, they're phony expressions, you know, they're not like really busting a gut laughing, but they try and show you how the face changes. One of the things I really like about this book is all the photos, um, one, they're in black and white, so you can just focus on the shapes of the face and the jaw and the eyes. There's people of various weights, various nationalities, various hairstyles, various ages. It's such a great resource. You can see how do the eyes look. Let me find one here. Where do the eyes go when someone is looking up or their head is tilted? How do their eyes look to the side? I'm going to find one. Here's one. So check out a facial expressions book. Maybe there's a website available, but this is a good book because all the photos are just like sort of the same quality. They're not exceptional quality, but they're the same quality. And I think that's really helpful. Here's another book. I don't know if I would recommend it per se. Um, sometimes I buy these books to see are they good to recommend. <laughs> it's okay. I think it's okay. It has a lot of drawings of faces, and I think it's more for someone who is drawing. Um, and it has a bunch of sketches in it. This is called The Artist's Complete Guide to Facial Expression. But I do think it is more for 2D artists. Come down. I think it's more for 2D artists. Um, and so you can see here that it's a bunch of, of drawings of faces. But you still might find it useful. You might find that it supports um, what you're trying to do capture different planes of the face. So as I'm going to show you an example. As an example, for one of my dolls, I used this face. This was my model face. I wanted a happy gnome face without making this gnome. And this face created this face. And can y'all see him? This face created this face. So I have sort of the high cheeks right here, the high cheeks, the pushing up right here in the cheeks, the angle of the mouth, and mostly the angles of the eyes. I noticed that in this little guy, the underneath part of his eyes kind of arch up. You see? Anyway, he was my model. Your little truth getting a lot of Oh, is he naked guy? I know, everybody loves naked guys. So naked guy, still, he's, he's pretty happy not to have any hands or anything, or any clothes. But even though I used the glass eyes on him, 
um, I just want to encourage that you find some pictures that inspire you and then model that face. Now, Alda, you guys have all seen Alda. Alda was modeled after a drawing, and maybe I can post the drawing later. But the drawing was actually of a very angry face. But the shape, the shape of her head is the same. And most of my dolls have a similar look. It's just, I go for that goofy sort of fantasy look. So, um, you know, they get these big, big cheeks and they have sort of uh, very unrealistic looks about them. But nonetheless, when you smile, you know, your cheeks will, your cheeks will push up. Um, Devin McCarroll asks, do you attach the noses separately? No, it's all part of the, the sculpture. It is, it's all part of the, the sculpture. I mean, I, I don't dig out the nose. Here's a tiny face as an example. He's, he's unfinished, this little guy. He's unfinished. Um, and he also has glass eyes. And here's a doll with a little bit less uh, feature definition and less expression. Y'all have seen her before. Might look at her a little bit differently now. The nose is applied to the face, but I sort of apply it to the face and sculpt it on the face. We have our doll workshop coming up next month, and I want you all to know that I've really been working on my homework, and my goal really, really, really is to do the doll video or videos this year, an early part of this year. Um, so I, I do promise to keep focusing on that goal so that I can show you also how, just how to do what I do, and then you'll take it wherever. Um, so just one more sort of bland look, if you look at this little guy, so another sort of more plain face. This is our pale peach. This is our new pale peach color compared to sand. Pale peach, sand. Yep, pale peach. I don't think that's peachy, I think that's pale peach. Separate though, so. Um, just get some photographs for yourself, some things to reference, and then model those. You can't get it wrong, and you can make a ton of heads, you know, and then get bodies later. That's how Naked Guy came. He was a head with no body and a body with no head, and they just came together in holy union. <laughs> so that was for Laura Ebert. Thank you, Laura, so much for your question. I appreciate that. And just to jump back real quick to mm -hmm. the uh, previous question. Okay. Diana wants to clarify, so with wet felting, is there a point in a project where the fibers will not felt together anymore? Yes. Is there a point where felting further may damage the, the project? But, well, it depends on the person. So Diana said, is it possible to just be done felting, I think? She's saying it. And the truth is, you're going to get to a point where it just won't shrink anymore. It just won't. And every project is different. From a yurt, to boots, to a hat, to a purse, to a wall hanging, to a scarf, to a pair of gloves, to a dress, the, the gamut is too wide. Um, so you don't necessarily need to use hard tools to wet felt something. You know, you know what I mean? You don't have to use something aggressive like wood. Um, so if you have something, a more specific project that you're working on, maybe you can email customer service and we can see if we can help you with that project. Cause it's a great big general question for something that has a hundred thousand different outcomes. So hard to answer in that little way. Okay. Okay, good. So we did facial expressions. Is that good? Do y'all have any questions for me before we move on from that? Yes. Okay. Sharon Denier asks, do you always make, oh, I didn't, oh, there it is. Okay. okay. Do you always make your heads with wires sticking out? I do now. I do now. I make my heads uh, on a wire, um, and I've showed this to you all a couple of times. The reason is, when I first made dolls, what I was shown to do was to make a head and sew it onto the body. Um, and I don't like to do that because you, you can't control the neck and you can't control the strength of the doll. And um, most of my dolls that have heads sewn on, I would say that, that doesn't have integrity. So this allows it to give integrity and it also would make it more poseable on your doll. Um, and the next thing I did before making the head independently was make the head on the doll. And I found that one part just got so messed up from overhandling while I was sculpting. Because you like to turn it all a hundred different ways while you're working with it. So now I make the heads independent. And Ailsa Moosemore asks, do you put the eyelids on last? La not last, but as part of the face, yeah. Not last, last, but as part of the face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, eyelids are added uh, independently for me. They are. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Cool. Okay. So let's look at some, the question was about wire and I brought in a collection of wires for you all to look at. And then another question. So let me see who asked what. Mac Kerr said, I would love to learn more about felting around an armature and how to use wet felting with an armature and how to create a firm body. So the first thing we'll look at is how to felt around an armature and how to felt a firm body. I'm going to give you like my three top tips for how to felt a very firm base or body to your sculpture. And then um, who else? I knew a couple of people said that they wanted to look at the armatures. Marie Marie also. Okay, so let me show you the wires in general first. And I'm just gonna hold these up first and talk about the different ones. We have a collection of wires available from thick to thin, and none of them are too difficult to work with. So why don't we start with our flimsiest, our flimsiest wire. This is our 32 gauge white wire. And should I put it down here? Should we turn the cameras down or keep them up for now? She answers, we're fine. Okay, so this is our 32 gauge wire. It's very flimsy, very malleable, but it does have a purpose, at least for me. Now I've used it for doll fingers, but only when I don't want them to hold on to something, or I use it in critter fingers. So this little guy, you all can look up and see our free uh, claws video. And this little guy, just get his, can you see his little fingers? Okay, his little fingers are made with this wire. Yep, and so when you want something really tiny and they don't need to have strength or integrity, you can use this wire quite easily. And I've also used it on my, my doll fingers, and so um, some of y'all have seen those. Um, I've been switching to the heavier gauge wire for my doll fingers when I want them to hold on to stuff. That's an example. Um, so this is made with that wire, this little hand, and they're very, they're bendy without being super poseable. Um, they're kind of easy to work with. But if I want those fingers to have more integrity and, or more strength or claws even, this is our um, 22 gauge, 22 gauge, right? And 22 gauge wire, it comes on a paddle. We currently sell it in um, black or white. And this stuff is a little more rigid, but still really easy to bend and work with. So you can bend it, you can twist it. And this little hand, I'm gonna show you now, this is like 38 yards or something. This will last you a long time. This little hand is made with that wire. Where do I go down? This little hand is made with that wire. So the fingers are very stiff. You could pose them a little bit more. She could hold on to something if you want. Like the witch that I posted online is made with this wire in her fingers and she can hold on to her broom handle. Um, just as an example. So if you want your fingers to have more strength and integrity, go with a little heavier wire. And those wires are folded back. I'm going to show you how to wrap wool today or how I wrap wool. Um, and they are folded in half so that you have something to bend on, twisty the wool on. Okay, so, so far, now we do have a finer wire. Remember that the um, bigger the number, the finer the wire. The bigger the number, the finer the wire. So this was the um, 22. This, I'm sorry, this is the 32. This is the flimsiest stuff that we carry. This is the 32, right, Anne? Okay, this is the 32. Um, and we also have a 24, which is new. Um, it's hard to see because it's just steel. It's actually a stainless steel wire. And I got this because Kiyoshi Mino, who's coming in August to teach the bird workshop, this is what he wanted. And he said, this is what he uses in his bird sculptures. And this is a 24 gauge wire. So if you just want something that's a little bit thinner, kind of in between the two, this might be a good option. It's uncoated, it's just stainless steel. Okay, and then all of my first dolls were made on this 18 gauge cloth coated wire. We sell it in a pack of 24. And all of my first dolls, even critters, were made on this wire. And I'm gonna just show you, um, 
two body examples, one made with the green. Here's Green Man. This is how I make my armatures for a doll, basically. Um, and just twisty the wires together. So you can't get this wrong. Uh, some of you have seen, you know what I didn't bring in was the chenille stems, but I, I have something with the chenille stem on it. If you don't know how you wanna make your armature, make it either in the chenille stems first or the green wire first, and just play with the shape um, so that you test it out. And here's a little tiny doll, and this is made with the um, 14 gauge wire. So I'll show you these two also. We have two more, um, two more thicknesses of wire, and they are our 12 and our 14. I'm gonna kind of hold those side by side. Do they show up, Anne? So you can see the thickness. Where do I go? This way. Okay. This is the this is the 12, and this is the 14. Do I have that right? I always see. No, I said I do it backwards. This is the 14, and this is the 12. 14, 12. They're both very malleable. They're both very easy to work with. One's just thicker and one's thinner. So this little guy here is done on the 14, little man. Little man is done on the 14. And this doll is done, well this is a combination. Hold on. And this guy is done on the 12. So if you can see that thickness. He's done on the 12. Where do I go? I'm not seeing. I'm not understanding. Okay. Good. Anne's giving me hand signals, but I don't know what they mean. <laughs> um, okay, so that's done on the 12. Just so you can see. So this stuff is very easy to bend and pose. You know, it is very easy to shape. And I'm going to show you how I shape a wire right now. And then we're going to wrap it. So the last thing I'll show you is the... Um, this is, again, the same 12 gauge wire. And then when you have a single wire, a bare wire, it can help to either wrap it with floral tape, which is sticky, or you can use a chenille stem. So if you don't want any additional girth, you might wrap it with a floral tape. Um, and if a little bit of extra girth is fine, you can wrap it with a chenille stem. When I have a double twisty wire, I don't really need the chenille stem, but some people add it anyway, you know, for extra grip, just as an FYI. Okay, any questions? Yes, we've got a few questions, but um, first, Rodney Jean Jr. says, <laughs> Happy Wooly Wednesday, what's happening, fairies? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rodney Jean. That's my husband, y'all, for those of you who want to know. That's my sweet, beautiful husband. Hi, sweet. Uh, Terry Truth shares that she's used to the 24-gauge wire for toes, and the wire keeps breaking. Oh. Do we have any suggestions for um, what she's what she can do to fix that or, or any suggestions for that? Well, I would just go with a stronger wire. If it's breaking because you're bending it, bending it, bending it, then just go with a stronger wire. I haven't had any issues with this paddle wire. With this paddle wire, I haven't had any issues at all. I think it depends on how many times you're bending it to have it achieve what you're trying to achieve. Like, why is it breaking? If it's breaking, it's just getting too much, you know, it's getting tweaked too much. And um, if you want to, uh, Rachel, they vary. Some are aluminum and some are stainless steel. Um, so. I would say if it's breaking, then it can't hold up to what you're doing. So you're going to need to step it up and go with the thicker wire. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And Jean asks, would the wool stick on the cloth coated wire better than the uncoated wire? It does, but it still it, it still helps if you have a double twist, which is why, like when I use the cloth coated wire, I twist two together. I also do that on my um, on my doll sculptures. I twist two wires together. Like in this case, it's the 12 and the 14 together. And when you get the twisties, it's easier for the wool to grab on it. So um, it, it's true that it does, but having the twisty helps also, helps the wool grab. So let's look at that, shall we? Let's just look at how to get the wool onto the wire and how to get a really nice firm sculpture. So what we're gonna do is turn the cameras down here. Okay, 
And where are we in? Let me see where we are. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I have my wire armature here. Um, I have my Earth Harmony foam pad and I have um, two types of needles. I have the blue 32 triangle, which is the coarsest needle that we carry. And I have the pink 36 triangle, which is the second coarsest needle that we carry. Okay. So let's see, where's my, do you see my wire around my bare wire? Oh, here it is. Okay. First I want to show you how I twist the wire. I'm going to do this really fast. And if we have time, we will do the, um, we'll do the wet felting over a wire too for Natasha Rez who asked. So your wire is going to come in a coil, that's fine. Just uncoil the length that you need and then cut it um, with your wires, with your wire cutters. Or am I in the frame? Okay. All right, this is how I twist wire. Bend it where you want the bend to be. Usually that's going to be in half, may not always be. Give it a good pinch so that you have a bit of a loop right there. I use, this is my dominant hand, I'm right-handed, and this is my supporting hand. Um, so I'm going to hold fast with my thumb and forefinger, and then these fingers back here are guides, and then I'm going to twist. Now notice that these two fingers hold a space. If you've seen, you can even spread the wires out. They don't need to be right next to each other. You can spread the wires out and then just twist. That's all I do to wrap my wire. Can we, is that all show up, Anne? Okay, so now this interestingly is a lot how I wrap the wool as well. And notice how controlled that is and how even. The key is to keep these guys from banging into each other. What do we need to do? Do I need to move? Okay, so I'm gonna set this one aside real fast so that if we can get to the wet felting portion, we can go ahead and use it. So I'll just finish it up. Okay, there we go. There we go. So that's a nice, long, long twisted wire. In this case, which guy am I doing? We have our CW1 core wool and the little sculpture that I brought in here a minute ago that we're gonna wrap. So here's my keys to, wrap, to wrapping, making a tight, firm body. The first step is to divide your core wool or whatever fiber you're using to small, thin increments. Here's how I do that. I mean, I had, this is a strip, it's probably a half ounce. So whatever your fiber is, divide it down, down, down. The easiest way to divide it is to fold it in half. Fold it in half and then split it down the middle. Just control it, don't let it get away from you. Don't let your hands get too far away from what you're working on. So then open that up again and notice how narrow and thin this is. Go ahead and peel that at least in half so that you have a bunch of super skinny, thin, lightweight pieces. If you're working on a little tiny arm or something, you can even go more narrow. So key one, the first step is get your wool to a very thin, narrow division that you can easily control. The second thing is, here's how I wrap wool, and Natasha, if you're watching, this is also gonna answer your question about how to not have the pokey outy parts uh, of your wool. So if you have legs or arms or whatever, in this case, the head or the bottom of the feet, you're gonna have to turn part of it back. So if you don't already have a loop, like the head loop, if you don't already have a loop, you gotta make one. And I teach this even with the most basic thing of making the gnomes, um, because if you have a, this wire, it's going to continue to find its way out. Okay, what we're going to do is wrap from the head. And I'm not going to wrap a whole, whole bunch, but I want to show you how I do it. I lay the wire on the fiber, and then I'm going to start part of it just by folding it over the top. And notice that some is sticking off this end. We're going to create what I call the cotton swab tip. So the first thing we do is give it a couple of twists so that the wool is, I'm getting caught in my bracelet, <laughs> so that the wool is, you know, wrapped around. And then we're going to fold this tip back and continue to roll. Can you see, Em? Do I need to start over? Can you guys see that? 
Okay, so notice that I let the wool stick off the tip, I rolled a couple of times, and then I folded that tip down. And now this part is nice and nice and cushy. So that's the first thing, is bend your tips and then cover the tips. And notice that also what I'm doing is I'm holding tension, just like we did in uh, wrapping the wire, twisting the wire. This hand is holding tension and this hand is twisting. And I would venture to say, one, I'm working at a really odd angle um, for how I normally work. I normally work this way, facing, you know, facing myself. But what I do is I just twist towards myself. I'm not used to working on a crate either. <laughs> I just twist towards myself and control the wool with my opposite hand. Does that show if I go at this angle? Okay, good. That is the key. So the key to making a firm body, the first thing is control your fiber and keep it very tight. Notice how tidy and neat that is. There's not a bunch of air. There are no twists. It's very uniform and very flat. And I'm gonna continue wrapping until I get to the end of this strip. So you don't even have to stop. Continue wrapping until you get to the end of a strip and then you're gonna needle felt it down. But what I encourage you to do is needle felt at, at the end of every strip. I won't go down the arms now because then I'll lose control. So what I'm gonna do is wrap this wool all the way down the body, holding it tight, holding it tight. You can build up all the bulk you want, but when you roll from the appendages, roll from the tip so that you can control where that wool goes and how much bulk goes on there. If you roll to the end, you might run out here and then it's all funky. So I always roll back towards the spine. So the keys are, can, you know, wrap your wool tightly with no air and as minimal lumps and bumps as possible. Use multiple layers and wrap to the end of each of those strips or tear it off if you're done. But when you needle felt, when you start, begin with a 32 triangle or a 36. And what I wanna show you is that the action with these needles is just a straight deep poke, a straight deep poke. It's not bouncy. If I bounce, nothing is happening. I'm just bouncing off the surface because this needle is so coarse. And the same with the, the 36 is less coarse, but the action is really a driving, driving, driving action. And usually I don't needle felt until I have more wool on. So notice that when you twist the wool onto the body like this, you can go up and down and back again. And when you get to the end of your strip, just for points of demonstration, let's say that I'm at the end of my strip, the end of my rope, man. What you can do is twist it in your hands, as long as you're going in the same direction, twist it in your hands and actually let your hands dry felt it a bit so that it stays in place. And it's one of the magics of working with batting over roving is it's going to bind to itself a little more readily. And then you're just gonna needle felt, as I always say, to the middle, to the middle, to the middle. No reason to poke through to the foam. The key to needle felting on armature is angle, 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 angle. Wrap tight so that you can minimize needle felting. And when you do have to needle felt, don't bang into the wire. Does that help? It does. We have a couple of felting friends wanting to know if you are covering the head loop, how do you attach the head? If you're well, this isn't for a human. So the one that I've just showed you now is for an animal. And if I were doing a human like this or elf or fairy or other thing, I would start wrapping here, you know, at the body. And what you can do, like with this little guy, you can attach the head first and then build the body. Like I would build the hands. He's kind of roughed up because I never finished him before putting him in and out of boxes and bags. But you can... Um, Either wait and do the whole body at the end, but make the hands make the hands first. And I would start wrapping, if I'm gonna build up some bulk, you could start wrapping here or just around the shoulders, but leave the neck free so that you can then add the head after. A couple of ways to do that, but that's one way to do it. The other thing is you can add the head before you start wrapping the body. Okay, anything else on that? Yes. I'll put him in. We had one more question. Okay. Uh, Sue Zuber says, you like wrapping 
by moving the wire versus yes. wrapping by moving the wool. Why yeah. is that? Sue, so the reason is when I first started felting, I was taught I was taught to wrap the wool over. So I just showed you my method, right? And I was taught to do this. I was taught to do this over, over. And even if you try and do it tight, what I find is that when you're in this, you know, crossover, that you're always like pulling, pulling, pulling. And for me, most of the time, I feel like I have much greater control holding tension as I wrap. For me, it's less loosey-goosey. Now, some people needle felt more loose than I do. I get, feel a lot of sculptures that come through the door that are much looser than I felt, and that's okay too. And some people felt much harder than me, and that's okay too. I just wanna control the wool, control the amount of air, and control the lumps and bumps. And this method works for me, and that's why I do it. Alrighty, and Terry Troop asks, if you make the head off the body, how do you attach the head after the body is finished? Yep, here's what I do, was that Terry? Mm -hmm. Okay, Terry. So here's what I do, and this head does not go with this body, so forgive that mismatch. But um, this case, like I said, you can attach the head first and then make the rest of the body, but that's what the loop is for. So the loop is uh, like a neck loop. If it's too long, you can always fold it, but I'm going to attach the head just like that. And then the rest of the part will become the neck. So the wires will get wrapped around. Um, and I'm going to finish this doll as, and other dolls and other faces and stuff as part of the uh, doll tutorial. Um, but that's what that loop is for, is for attaching. And once you build up this, it looks like it's really long leg right now, but once you build up the shoulders and everything, that space gets taken up. And always, if this is too tall, you can always bend it down, you know, and make space. And Linda asks, after you wrap the wool around the wire and secure the wool, do you firm up the wool between layers that you, the wool that you're adding? Each layer. I needle felt after every layer, and that's the key. Needle felt after every layer. Every layer after layer, you want to you want a needle felt. So that's the key is to firm it up then. And if you do that, if you're willing to take the time, the underbody takes more time. You might be surprised than even to make a face. It takes time and it takes the willingness to do it. But if you do that, you're going to end up with a firm sculpture that will come apart as people are handling it. You'll be able to shape it more and sculpt it better after. And you'll be able to get a lot of character and detail. But also, it's going to allow you to get a really smooth finish if the underneath part is fairly firm. And then when you go back with your 42 needle, like this little gal, you go back with your 42, you can still be gentle, but it's got a firm base under there that you're pushing against. We're almost out of time. Okay, are we good? Is that helpful with the, uh, helpful with the needle felting? Yes. Let's just move this party. We're gonna stay right here, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift our set and we're gonna uh, wet felt over an armature. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my towel down so I don't make too big of a mess. Thank you, Anne. Um, right here. And I think it was Natasha Rez who asked about this. I made a quickie. She asked about wet felting over an armature and she even showed us a little viney, swirly thing. I don't know where the picture went. This is wet felting over armature and I made it super fast. So honestly, it's barely felted. But the tips that we just talked about um, convey the same and um, so you can make vines. She wanted to make vines or, you know, something like that. So does it, that all show? Are we pretty good there? Or do I need to be back this way? Back this way a little bit. Your way or my way? Your way. <laughs> here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here it looks like I need to be that way. Okay. So let me find the wire I twisted. Here it is. Okay. So here's our long straight wire and we would want loops on both ends. So I'm just going to clip this off and then just fold this end back in. You can use these sometimes as hooks to grab onto your wool. And what I have here to make something like this swirly do is a towel, of course, the wire. This is the short fiber merino bats. Um, this is kiwi, beautiful, beautiful color. It's very thin and wispy, it's 19 microns. 
And you'll notice that I've prepared it into thin little tiny strips, just like we did with the needle felting. Okay, so we're going to follow the very same principles. If it helps you, you can stick your wool like through a loop and get it started there, anchor it. Um, I'll just draft it out a little bit. And what we're going to do is wrap this piece. Again, we put this basically on the fiber. You're going to twist, let it stick off the end a little bit so that you go a couple twists, fold it in, make your cotton swab tip, and then twist. Now, this is a lumpy bumpy wire and a super thin, thin, thin batting. Um, so you can add as much as you want and you can also go back and add layers. A couple of weeks ago, I showed, showed these little like ferny, ferny swirly tips and I didn't, um, I didn't realize we'd be doing this today or I would have brought them back, but they are wet felted and maybe I'll try and post a picture later. And which gauge of wire are you working with right now? Oh, this one is the, um, the 14. Right, the thinner one, a 14. See, I always get them mixed up. <laughs> I want the thin one or the thick one. Okay, so we're going to the end, and you'll notice that I just flip-flopped my hand, and that's so I can keep moving. Um, you want to keep moving the same direction, so if you run out of fiber, um, you just have to kind of figure that out. I'm twisting this way, so I'll just keep twisting. I'll go over the end again, sort of fold it back and make a little curly, cute, cotton swab tip. And then I'm just going to tear this off or I could, I don't know, I could just keep going, I suppose. So now notice that this fiber is staying on firstly, this nice little batting. It's really gripping. It's not coming off like a roving would kind of want to come off a little bit more. And you could make a bracelet like this. You could make a necklace like this. You could make the vines. We have a video for making snakes, which is a fun project for children. So I have my olive oil soap and just some water. And all I'm gonna do is let my table get wet. Does everything show up? Is soap my hands. The water's already kind of soapy, but I'll just work right over the bucket. Can you see if I'm over the bucket? Okay. So I'm just gonna wet this. Now notice I'm not rubbing or anything. I'm just kind of squishing water in. Get all this out of your way. I'm just kind of squishing water in. You can't get this wrong. You know, make a thing or two and see what you're inspired to make. And right now we're just doing, you know, when just think about when we're wet felting, there's always the wetting out, pat, you know, padding stage. We wrapped it tight so it's not real loosey-goosey in the first place. And if it is anywhere, just add water and soap and don't worry about it. If you're making a vine or something, it doesn't matter anyway. You know, it can be bumpy and lumpy. And then when you go to felt it, go ahead and soap and wet both hands. And I'm actually just going to gently, gently, gently roll it between my hands. You can pat the end and add a plenty of soap. Like at first I'm not using much pressure or friction. I'm just rolling it between my fingers. Ooh. Kelly Driscoll shares that she's become a bat convert. So oh. much faster and easier to wet oh, felt. Oh yeah, they, they are. They're really nice to work with. And I, I love Merino Top for a lot, a lot of things. Um, but there are some things that these bats are really good for. And wet felting three-dimensional items is one of them. So if you notice that there's any air in there, just go back. And like I said, this is, you can have fun with this, making snakes for kids or a project like that. And you can get really thick with them. Um, and then just go back and forth. Now, the other thing you can do is go up and down the length. These are real short fibers and they're gonna migrate together really fast. Can we get a, a close-up view of a, the texture and how it looks right now? Uh-huh. Does it show? Can you focus? It's really, you know, it's really pretty neat stuff, these, these short fiber bats. And so I'll try and post a picture later this evening of my little, my little ferny bits for you to see. And I just built them up layer after layer. And I would kind of like loosely wet and felt this layer and then add another layer and then add another layer and couple, rather than wet felting at the end. Mm -hmm. A couple of our felting friends are wondering if the, any of the wires rust. Oh, or... Or well, are if we it's, worried about if it's dry, no, because it's not going to be wet all the time. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be wet all the time. These are aluminum wires, you know, and it's going to dry. 
So I wouldn't worry about that. And Pam asks, how long does your olive oil soap last? It looks like you're not using that much. <laughs> ever and ever. <laughs> the only key to working with the olive oil soap is to let it dry out in between. Let it dry out in between uses and it'll last a long time. Because it's a hard milled soap and it's 72% olive oil, you know, it's, it's really a hard soap. So I'll just show that to you guys, of course, we would rinse it, you know, and then let it dry. But you don't have any pokey outy tips um, and it felt so easy, so easy, so easy. So, and Patty asks, are you using cold water? Yeah, it's cold. It's just cold. You don't even, you know, you don't even need hot water when you have really fine fibers. Honestly, you don't. Let me turn this back up. Okay. So those are my, my, uh, our super, those were our super quickie demonstrations for wrapping wire, um, wrapping wool, uh, wet felting them, and needle felting a body. And I hope those help. Just little, little primers. I hope they help. Um, are there any final questions on this fun topic for today? I think, and I think I got everyone's questions. <laughs> well, we, we don't have any questions yet, but Jenny barnes Doyle shares, OMG, I just saw how great this would be as an asparagus bracelet. Oh, <laughs> asparagus, that sounds fun. <laughs> Very good. And Joanne Nogler asks, must it dry before adding another layer? No, 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 don't dry in between layers, Joanne. In fact, just barely felt between layers. So keep the wool tight in the first place. Just wet it and soap it down and add the next layer. Wet it, soap it down, and add the next layer. So no, you don't want to let it dry um, in between. There's no reason to. Just keep adding your layers as you go. The, the, the hard part is keeping your hands dry because your hands are wet and sticky and soapy and you kind of want to keep them that way. And then you've got to add another layer. So you just got to dry your hands in between. Judy Wilson mm -hmm. asks, can you mix silk with this when wet felting? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, the silk blends that we sell are the same. So, uh, like, this is, a, this is actually a silk blend, and it may not seem like it because it's not a Bombix silk. The Tussa silk is dyed. So this is green silk in there, whereas this one um, is a Bombix silk. The white thread is an undyed Bombix silk. So absolutely, they will wet felt all together. You don't have to do anything special. And if you want to hand, hand blend them, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a couple of our felting friends are wondering about the soap. Does that stay in? Is it out? And you'll rinse the soap out. You can do a vinegar soak if you want. Um, it just helps get the last bit of soap out and it also helps return the wool back to its natural state, which is a little more acidic. And that makes it generally a little bit softer, a little bit more of its normal color, whatever you're doing. Get all the soap out. And mm -hmm. last question. Last question. <laughs> Diana asks, what it what happens if it goes dry in between adding a couple layers? Let's say something comes up and you need to take a break from the project for a day or two. Yeah, two. just come back, just wet it and start again. You might find, you know, you might find when you're wrapping like this that maybe um, you don't want them to separate is all. You don't want to lose your traction of the fibers holding on to them. So if you're going to leave this open, then leave it in. What you could also do is wrap it in something and keep it damp. I wouldn't do that for more than two days or it'll start to get musty and moldy. But you could, you know, keep it in a baggie or something until you come back if you want to kind of keep the most moisture in. I just wouldn't go more than a couple days. Mm -hmm. But in general, you can let projects dry out and come back and felt them later, but in this case, um, I haven't really done it, so I would just say the danger would be the layers starting to kind of drift apart as they dry out, and you might want to avoid that. Okay, good. Well, I hope that was helpful, and I look forward to visiting back uh, this evening and seeing what you all have asked or contributed, because um, I always love to hear your ideas also. And I will try and post my ferny bits that I made. And um, hang tight, you know, for the doll. Uh, I, I do really, really want to bring the dolls back this year and revive our tutorials to be fresh and up to date. We have a surprise for you next week. I really hope that we have that going. And in two weeks, we have a very special Wooly Wednesday, so I want you to put your party dress on. It's going to be a really special time. Um, so next week, we're going to die together. 
<laughs> and we have a fun new announcement, a surprise, and then in two weeks, we're going to like have a really fun time. Okay. <laughs> now the fairies are back. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. last, 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 last question. Uh -huh. <laughs> Kate Williams would like to know what kind of dyes we'll need for next week. Oh, well, if you want to dye with us, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to work with our, um, we're going to work with our acid dyes. We're also going to look at the Color Hue Instant Dyes, which are for silks. And we're going to look at, our goal is to do the instant dyeing, some kettle dyeing, and some microwave dyeing. That's about all that we can probably achieve. Now, we may, if we're really masterful, squeeze in one more. I know. We might. But we'll do our best. So whatever you've got. Now, I don't know that there'll be time to pace it real slow as in dying with us. <laughs> but we're mostly going to be working with the acid dyes and the color hue instant dyes. That's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to give away some prizes. So for everybody whose question made it to the show today, and people who contributed along the way, Anne's put your name in this little bucket so it's quite full. Who's it? Anne, you've done a lot of work. You pull the first one. Oh, yeah, you just pull the first one. Okay. <laughs> We oh, got stuck there. <laughs> Sue Zuber. Yay! Yes. Sue, congratulations! You're our first prize winner. What did she win? And she wins one of the short fiber merino bags. <laughs> oh, yay, Sue! Yes. So that's a four ounce bundle. That's how it comes. You can pick any of the however many colors. She's got 32. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Around there. Any one of those colors you want, pick a four ounce bundle and we'll get it out to you. Congratulations, Sue. Okay, who's next? Sam. Did you get two, two? Just pick one. <laughs> oh. Um, this is, oh. Mark. Matt. Matt Kerr. Yay! Yeah. Matt Kerr! All right, so Matt asked a question. Oh, right, Matt's the one who asked about what felting over an armature. Very good, very good. Okay. So Matt wins. In armature assortment. <laughs> <laughs> but Max, so you can play with a few of the different kinds of wire that we offer and see what works for whatever you're doing. Very cool. Maybe the next one. Oh, oh you do it. I'll hold it. I'll, hold it. <laughs> I'll, I'll work with you on this one. All righty. Alyssa, Elsa, Elsa, Elsa Yay! <laughs> She's in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. What does she win, Anne, Elsa? Yeah. She wins her choice of two two ounce rolls of our MC1. But Elsa, I don't know if you have our MC1. I don't know, but yeah, we think you do. But anyway, pick two colors from our 85-ish <laughs> <laughs> assortment. Email y'all, email customer service at livingfelt.com. Tell us your color choices. We'll get them out in the mail to you right away. If we don't have your address or whatever, give us your whole address and your email and your phone number, but I think we do. Thank you guys for being with us today. Happy end of February. Be good to yourself. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.